25 years ago, the chance remark of a child taken into care led to one of the biggest murder investigations in British history. She said, I've got another sister. And the foster mother said, have you, where is she? And she said, under the patio. Gloucestershire police began digging up the garden at the home of Fred and Rosemary West. What they found would uncover the depraved and shocking secrets that had bound the Wests together for years. This vacant plot is where number 25 Cromwell Street once stood. It's now been demolished. This was done at the request of the families of the nine victims recovered at the address. Most serial killers are men, but one of the key things about Fred and Rose West is they're a couple. They created a spider's web in which they sucked people in and then were able to do what they wanted with them. The Wests maintained a facade of normal family life. But what went on behind closed doors here was far, far darker. In her first television interview, a former lodger at Cromwell Street tells us how she escaped just in time. He took me to the cellar and it was a dark, dank place. There was a little bed in there, but I just thought it was for the children. I found out years later on that it wasn't. And the family of one of the murdered women speak for the first time about their horror and grief. It came on the television, Cromwell Street's bodies. I just knew deep down she was going to be there. Before Fred West could face justice, he committed suicide. Rose West was jailed for life. She has never accepted her guilt. We needed her to admit what she'd done, but she denied it. Now we uncover the truth about the Wests and the role Rose West played in their murderous partnership. It's tempting to think that he would be the dominant individual, but she was very manipulative. She put a pillow over my head. At that point, I thought I might die. There was this dark side to her that could explode. And in those moments of fury, I would say that Rose would be capable of absolutely anything. Twenty-five years ago, one of the most disturbing and chilling murder cases in Britain came to light when the police began digging up the garden of an ordinary house in an ordinary street. This is a 3D floor plan of 25 Cromwell Street. The Wests lived here for more than 20 years, and in that time, they killed nine people. I reported on it at the time. Reports from Gloucester on the latest charge and today's other developments. The news shocked and horrified the nation. Another morning's drilling has located body number six. And what became known as the Gloucester House of Horrors was the biggest story of its time. All the bodies had some bones missing, indicating they'd been mutilated after death. Police discovered another three bodies elsewhere, bringing the total number of murders to 12. The victims were all female, between the ages of 8 and 27. At least two of them were lodgers at Cromwell Street at the time of their disappearance. I've come to the city of Gloucester to find out how Fred and Rose West were able to escape detection for more than 20 years. As a journalist, Howard Soons broke major stories about the West case and wrote the best-selling book about the crimes. What could life have been like for a family here? Oddly enough, the West in this street were considered to be among the more stable families. Uh, Fred did odd jobs for the neighbors down the street. They could be very charming. But even so, all of the houses are very close around. It's very difficult to imagine all that happening without any knowledge of people around. It's a slightly transient community. That's part of the issue. Mm. We can imagine that this is where the house was. Yeah. So they've tried to cover up all traces of it, but do you see this line of sort of mastic? Yes. So this would have been what Fred called his Wendy house, which was basically just a shed, because one of the grotesque aspects of it is is that this area was really a sort of play area for the children. The Wests are having a family life here, whereas there are bodies un right under underfoot. This is macabre in the extreme. During the 21 years the Wests were living at Cromwell Street, as well as bringing up a family, they also took in lodgers. 
Jane Hamer rented a room at the top of the house when she was 16 years old. She has not spoken on television before. How well did you get to know the Wests? I got to know Fred fairly well. Um, he was a pleasant landlord. We never had any reason to have crosswords. Rosemary was harder to get on with, very domineering, very curt. She seemed like a very controlling person. Rose definitely ruled the roost. I'm wondering about the general atmosphere in the house. Would you describe it as fairly normal, genial? It seemed fairly normal when the children were around and I would very often look after them when Fred and Rosemary went out. When I look back now, I do wonder why I was babysitting for the children. What were they doing? Maybe they weren't going out drinking. Maybe they were going out finding victims. The Wests presented the appearance of a normal family life. The children attended local schools, and Fred West was an industrious worker, employed as a jobbing builder by Derek and Wendy Thompson. Fred wanted to work every day. Uh, Fred would go out to a job on Christmas Day if I asked him. He was, uh, you know, an a perfect employee. When I used to take him out to jobs uh, in my car, and he would talk incessantly. We used to hear all sorts uh, of... Orgy parties, he used to tell me about... But we didn't believe him. We didn't... We just so, didn't listen yeah, to Just him. went in one ear and out the other. Fred West put his building skills to use at his home, extending the house and fixing up the cellar. The cellar becomes a key part of this story. It becomes a dungeon, a torture chamber, and it also became a place where they buried victims. Later, West concreted over the floor and the cellar became a bedroom for the younger children. They slept there completely unaware that beneath them lay the bodies of five young women. 18-year-old Juanita Mott was one of them. Belinda and Mary Ann, her younger sisters, are speaking together on camera for the first time. That's the three of us on that one photograph. Juanita had disappeared without trace in 1975. I knew something was wrong because mm. she always said to me, I'll always be there for you. Mm. It was a constant search. Everything that we could think of, we'd do. And if we weren't getting any response, we'd try a different angle. Belinda, you visited the house in Cromwell Street when your sister was missing. Yeah. I had a friend, she rented one of the rooms upstairs. Rose West would be sat on the doorstep with um, the kids. There was always two kids sat in a big pram outside and other ones, like, running around. What sense did you have when you went there about the general nature of the place? It was just a dump. It was horrible. I didn't like it. I said to my friend, hey, can you live here? It's horrible. And she said, it's cheap. When I think about now, when I was upstairs, and little did I know that Juanita was under the staircase downstairs. It was just eerie. The Wests had got away with murder for years, but they were also sexually abusing some of their children. And despite being threatened to stay silent, one of the daughters told a friend what had been going on. The youngest children were taken into care and would never again return to the family home. Fred and Rose West were arrested. Leo Goatley was the duty solicitor. Firstly, there was a tendency to blame the children, which is never a good sign uh, in any abuse case. Uh, and secondly, a preoccupation with, uh, I hope they're not going to interfere with the house in their search. The children were too scared to give evidence against their parents, and the case collapsed. The Wests thought they were off the hook. But one of the detectives, Hazel Savage, discovered that 16-year-old Heather West had not been seen for six years. She was one of those intuitive kind of detectives who didn't feel happy about the situation. There was this story about Heather who had been a very difficult. She's left home, she's gone. And that triggered Hazel Savage to make inquiries and no national insurance or social security records came back. Subsequently, while in care and away from the influence of their parents, the West's children began to talk about their life at Cromwell Street. One of the children said to a foster mother, I've got another sister. And the foster mother said, have you? Where is she? 
and she said under the patio. If that foster mother had just thought this is silly and ignored it, I wouldn't have been surprised because it sounded too fanciful, really. The foster mother, in fact, took it to the social services. Social services talked to the police. And the rest, they say, is history. Finally, the West's crimes were about to be exposed. It would be beyond the scope of any investigation the Gloucestershire police had ever undertaken. And then Fred West made a chilling confession. February 1994. The police are digging up the garden of Fred and Rose West after their daughter told the carer that her sister Heather was buried under the patio. But before any remains could be found, Fred West made a startling confession. Then I brought the two hands up and grabbed her around the neck. But I mean, I, didn't, I, mean, I didn't grab her around the neck to, to choke her or do nothing. All I was going to do was grab her around the neck and shake her. He says, it was me. I did it. Yeah, fair cop. I killed Heather. Fred decided I'll take the rap for this. And maybe I'll get off. Maybe I'll serve a few years and I'll come home and we'll still have Cromwell Street. And Rose will be waiting for me. Rose West was also questioned by police, but she denied any involvement in Heather's death. I went over to see Rose, and she was very quiet, not wanting to say much, and cursing Fred, really, more than, you know, she wanted to, if she said anything, it was about that effing Fred West. Within two days, the police had excavated a femur, or thigh bone, from the garden. They presumed this was just a tragic domestic murder until forensic pathologist Professor Bernard Knight made a shocking discovery. They dug a big hole in the ground which went down and groped around and found two more femurs. I remember the famous <laughs> remark I made to him that either we found the first three-legged woman or you've got more than one body. And that was the start of it, really. Confronted with the evidence, Fred West now admitted to a second murder. He may have hoped that the police would then stop digging. But when he realized that they were planning to take his home apart, he wrote an extraordinary note. I wish to admit to a further approx nine killings, expressly Charmaine, Rena, Linda Goff, and others to be identified. West was taken back to Cromwell Street to mark the location of the other bodies. He was adamant that he'd acted alone and that his wife was not involved. Professor David Cantor is an expert in investigative psychology. Why does he think West confessed so easily? People give confessions because they think there's no alternative, and that's what he became aware of and thought he could manipulate it. And he may well have convinced himself that this was some sort of heroic act that he could uh, carry out in order to, to save Rose. Unusually, police knew the identity of the murderer, but not the identity of most of the victims. It was what the investigation team called an upside-down murder. Professor David Whitaker, a leading forensic dentist, was brought onto the case. He had refined a painstaking technique to identify victims by matching teeth and points on their skull to a photograph. The real problem is when you don't have dental records. So I said to the police early on, what we need to do, I think, is to collect photographs of missing females in Britain. There were thousands of women reported missing at that time, but an examination of the recovered bones put the victims' ages between 15 and 25. Well, that dropped it to a few hundred. And then they started collecting these photographs. Professor Whitaker was then able to use his technique to start putting names to the victims. West had now admitted to 11 murders, nine hidden away in the cellar and garden at Cromwell Street, and two others buried elsewhere. He also divulged the location of a 12th body. While Rose West maintained her innocence, Fred West wouldn't stop talking. A bizarre mix of truth, fantasies, and lies. 
you're trying to make it, I just went out and blatantly killed somebody. No. Enjoyment turned to disaster. Gloucestershire police were now certain that West was a prolific serial killer whose true persona had been disguised for years. Fred was always the guy to have a joke about this would be a great place to hide a body. He was such an ineffectual, garrulous non-entity that his mates would just sort of laugh him off. They didn't take him seriously. Behind this facade, you know, there was this monster. The police wanted to know when West started killing and why. Fred West grew up in a village 16 miles from Gloucester. He left school barely able to read or write. He soon got into trouble for petty theft. But when he was 19, he was charged with a far more serious crime involving his 13-year-old sister. Fred was accused of having sex with his sister, who became pregnant. When it came to court, his sister said, I'm not going to give evidence against my brother. And so the case collapsed. But it's the start of a lifetime of deviant sexuality. One year later, West met Rena, who was to become his wife for the next nine years. Rena's first child was not by Fred. It was a girl called Charmaine. We don't know who the father was. Soon after they married, Rena had another daughter, Fred West's first child. Rena wanted help with the children, so her friend Anna McFall came to live with them. This is a picture of Anna McFall. So far as we know, she was Fred West's first victim. The 18-year-old was nearly seven months pregnant with Fred West's child when she disappeared without trace. We don't really know why Fred murdered Anna. There was rope in her grave, which means probably he tied her up. And also she was cut up. Her body was dismembered. Fred West always denied murdering her, but he was able to show police roughly where he'd put her body. That first murder is very significant in enabling Fred West to understand some of the technicalities of how you kill somebody. And he will have been aware that there were certain risks involved, but that if he behaved in a particular way, he could get away with it. Around the time of Anna's murder, Fred West's volatile marriage broke down. Rena went to Scotland, leaving West looking after her two young daughters, Charmaine and Anna Marie. 27-year-old Fred West was now on the hunt for another partner. And he was soon to find his perfect match, 15-year-old Rosemary Letts. In a pattern that was to become familiar, West picked her up at a bus stop. Hers was a tough, unconventional upbringing. Rose grew up in a dysfunctional household where incest was part of what went on. We think that her father sexually abused her. Within a year of meeting West, Rose was pregnant and living with him at a flat at Midland Road in Gloucester. I think because of the abuse and the way she'd reacted to the abuse before she'd met Fred, it had made her very sexually promiscuous. Anything went. It's tempting to think that he would be the dominant individual. But I think it's very probable that she will have been able to manipulate Fred and to offer herself to him in various ways in order to get what she wanted out of him. Rose certainly seemed to have some sort of hold over Fred West. When they were arrested in 1994, he consistently refused to implicate Rose in any of the murders. Rose was stronger than Fred psychologically. So when they were under the police spotlight, they were accused of murder. Rose kept her cool. I know nothing. I didn't do it. It was all Fred. Rose discovered very early on that by refusing to admit to anything, she's also keeping at bay the detailed examination of all her activities. Police thought it unlikely that Fred West could have committed nine murders at home without his wife's knowledge. The question was, to what extent was Rose West involved? The police continued to look into her past for clues, and they found some disturbing evidence. Not long after Rose and Fred West had moved in together, 
he was sent to prison for dishonesty and theft. 17-year-old Rose was left looking after Rena's two young girls and Heather, her own newborn baby, at the Midland Road flat. There's evidence from neighbours that she's mistreating the children and being sadistic. And it seems she really doesn't like Sharna. It's not her child after all. Indeed, it's not Fred's child. Sometime in June 1971, Charmaine disappeared. Rose told everyone that she'd gone to live with Rena, her birth mother. The little girl was found 23 years later under an extension built by Fred at the back of the flat. Although Fred West confessed to killing Charmaine, he was in prison around the time she died. So the police suspected that the killer of the eight-year-old was probably Rose. Rena West comes back from Scotland. She came looking for a child who, in fact, was dead. So Fred and Rose had a big problem. Fred later gave the impression that he took Rena out drinking. He got her drunk and took her to Letterbox Field, just outside Much Markle, and he killed her. Two women and a child were already dead. But by the end of the 1970s, that toll would become much higher. How do serial killers emerge? I would argue that they become very aware of who the vulnerable victims are. And if you kill somebody um, as part of some psychological desire and get away with it, then you're much more dangerous. In 1972, the Wests married and moved into 25 Cromwell Street with their growing family. Needing money to help pay the mortgage, this was the point at which they started to take in lodgers, attracting young women like Jane Hamer. Did you form any impressions of the relationship between Rose West and her husband, Fred West? I realised that things weren't... Um, that weren't a normal couple. I kind of sat in the living room with the children one night and the doorbell went and a red light lit up. And that was when I found out that Rose was having other men was Fred West aware of what his wife was doing? Yes. Definitely. Extraordinary place to live. If a husband wants to let his wife sleep with other men, then that's their business. But I didn't like it. I didn't like it. It wasn't normal. There was a highly charged sexual atmosphere in the house. Men were drawn to Cromwell Street by advertisements in contact magazines. Fred was the ultimate voyeur. He liked to hide in the cupboard with a camera and film her with men. Very, very weird. Fred West was already a sadist, but Rose's appetites were at least as dark. She didn't know where to draw the line. The weirder, the better. The stranger, the better. The more violent the sex was, the better. In Rose, Fred West had met the perfect partner, a young woman willing to indulge in his darkest fantasies and take them even further. Although Fred had the desire to involve himself in all sorts of sexual activity, I think it's very likely that she was encouraging that and facilitating it in various ways. I suspect that there was this dark side to her that could explode with a fury. And in those moments of fury, I would say that Rose would be capable of absolutely anything. Before long, the Wests would lure others into their sordid activities. They'd created a sort of spider's web in which they sucked people in and then were able to do what they wanted with them. In 1994, police found nine sets of remains at 25 Cromwell Street. There were bones missing from all of them. These have never been found. In the graves, police also discovered evidence of torture, including ropes and masks made from packing tape. The West would feel some power and significance by having control of individuals. And once they started doing that and gagging and binding the victims so that they could abuse them without them struggling, they would feel even more power. As the police inquiry progressed, a picture of the West's modus operandi emerged, which often involved offering lifts to young women. 
hitching and accepting lifts was a more common activity in the Gloucestershire area in the 1970s. One of the key things about Fred and Rose West as a murder case is they're a couple. Most serial killers are men who operate alone. The world thinks of Mrs. West as this frumpy, middle-aged housewife, but she was this pretty young teenage girl when the murder began. In 1973, three young women went missing. First was 19-year-old Linda Goff, one of the West's lodgers. She disappeared in April. Her mother was told that she'd moved on. Then in November, 15-year-old Carol Ann Cooper went missing from a bus stop. And in December, 21-year-old student Lucy Partington also vanished, again from a bus stop. For Lucy's sister Marion, life would never be the same. My mum said Lucy didn't come home last night. And we all knew that something had happened because she wasn't the kind of person to just leave. The police did roadblocks and searches, and there was a lake nearby the bus stop, and that was dragged. There was posters put up all over the area. My brothers presumed that she had been abducted. I didn't make the step in my own mind. My mother also held out hope for a long time. This whole business of someone disappearing is a hugely shattering experience the agony of living with not knowing. In April 1974, a 21-year-old Swiss student, Therese Siegenthaler, went missing, probably after hitching a lift. And later that year, 15-year-old Shirley Hubbard became the third victim to vanish from a bus stop. It was clear that the West's sadistic behavior was intensifying. Shirley's grave revealed yet more evidence of torture. They would be looking for new and more exciting turn-on from their activities that would give them the excitement that they were searching and the feeling of significance that they were searching in their otherwise really quite mundane lives. By 1974, the local press began to link the cases of young women who were just disappearing from the side of the road but there was no evidence to point towards the Wests or Cromwell Street. It was then in April 1975 that Belinda and Mary Ann's sister Juanita disappeared. It's thought she'd been hitchhiking into Gloucester. How did you make the connection between the disappearance of your sister and the Wests? Came on the television, Cromwell Street's bodies. I just knew deep down she was gonna be there. You hope that she's not. But I knew, mm. as soon as I heard it, she's going to be there, because I couldn't find her anywhere. There was no tracing of her anywhere. You don't think it's going to happen in your little Gloucestershire town, but it does. And knowing how close she was to all of us, yes, she'd go off, but she'd always come back. Something had to have happened. It must have been extremely traumatic to hear about your sister's demise. Yeah, I find it really, really hard. Mum sort of hit the floor and we had to scrape her up daily. Literally, she just didn't function. She wouldn't dress, she wouldn't wash. There was no coming back from this. It must be too awful to describe when you finally learn the truth about how she mm. yeah. died. Mm. Yeah, we were told mm -hmm. um, that she was tortured. There were fingers missing. She liked, she liked to party and stuff like that, but she would never have um, said yes to going down there and doing what they, they like to do. There's no way she wasn't that sort of person at all. Within the space of two years, six young women had been killed, cut up, and hidden at 25 Cromwell Street. But why did the Wests bury their victims at home? Getting rid of the body when you've killed somebody is actually quite a challenging process, and it's often the way in which stranger murderers um, actually are caught through the body being found. So I think 
Fred and Rose realized that they had to be very careful. Fred was always doing work around his house, and so that was the easiest and, and most direct place to leave the remains. He would have control over that, he could do it in secret without people uh, really becoming suspicious of, of what was going on. Many of the West's lodgers didn't stay sufficiently long to notice anything amiss. But one lodger, Jane Hamer, did become concerned. Fred West took you down to the cellar. Took me to the cellar and showed me the cellar, and I think that's what perturbed me more than anything. It was a dark, dank place. There was a little bed in there, but I just thought it was a den for the children. Yes. And it's found out years later on that it wasn't. Did you have any suspicions about what was happening? None at all, until the last couple of weeks that I was there, which is when I heard screaming in the middle of the night, stop it, Daddy, stop it, Daddy. Please stop it, Daddy. And it sounded like one of the children, and that was my reason for leaving. Did you ever think of telling somebody about it? I was 17. I'd left home at 16. Who was going to believe a 17-year-old? I wonder whether you could describe to me your reactions when you were told what happened to some of the other people in the house. Disbelief is the only way to describe it. I sometimes think that being shown the cellar was maybe my way forward. Maybe it was going to be me next. I thought I got away at the right time. You thought it could have been you? Yes. It's quite likely that Jane Hamer left just in time. Her friend and fellow lodger, 18-year-old Shirley Robinson, another vulnerable teenager, was to fall victim to the Wests. Fred gets Shirley pregnant. And it seems that Shirley entertained fantasies that she and Fred might get married. She might be the next Mrs. West. And it seems that Rose became very jealous. Rose now had a motive for killing her, or for telling Fred to get rid of her. Shirley disappeared when she was eight months pregnant. The Wests again evaded detection by telling everyone that she'd gone to live abroad. A year later, they befriended and killed another troubled teenager, 17-year-old Alison Chambers. For the next eight years, there's no evidence of any other murders at Cromwell Street. There's always going to be a question as to whether the West stopped killing or whether they became much more cautious about what they did with the bodies. It's very difficult to know. All sorts of other things intrude on their lives. Rose started having babies, and there will be changes in their, their predilections, in their sexual appetites. Rose West was now the mother of eight children, and they became the target for her sadistic tendencies. A big part of Fred and Rose's life is family, but Rose was the one who had the terrifying temper, who flew off the handle, who screamed at them, who beat them. The West children were taken to hospital 31 times in 20 years. One child had a sexually transmitted infection. Others had injuries that should have rung alarm bells. So why didn't the authorities suspect the abuse at 25 Cromwell Street? John Fitzgerald led the official review into some of the child protection issues that came out of the case. People who injure children, they're, they're very good at disguising what they're up to. They always get their story straight before they go to hospital. So they know precisely what they're going to say. And they've worked out over time what will be accepted by professionals. The Wests became adept at fending off any unwelcome scrutiny. A paediatrician visited Cromwell Street and what she saw was a very normal family life being acted out in front of her. And she went away and reported back that um, I couldn't find anything that was of concern. The children were terrorised and intimidated into silence. However, one of the eldest children had decided to move away and her sister, 16-year-old Heather, was also desperate to leave. Heather West was on the point of leaving home. And I think Fred and Rose feared that she might go to the police. That was their great fear. This was when Heather, their firstborn child, 
was killed and then buried under the patio at Cromwell Street. It seemed the West would stop at nothing to avoid detection. But of course, in an ironic twist, it was Heather's disappearance that led the police to their door nearly seven years later. Their search exposing all the other murders the Wests had successfully hidden for years. By June 1994, the police believed they had enough evidence to jointly charge both Fred and Rose West with all the Cromwell Street murders. The pair were reunited for the first time in four months at a remand hearing, but Rose West now chose to distance herself from her husband. Rose wanted nothing to do with him, did not want to be associated with him in the dock. He was snubbed, he was rejected by this woman, Mrs. West, who had been the, you know, the major figure in his life for 20 years. And then, a few months later, he hanged himself. The only person who could reveal the truth about Rose's involvement in the murders had now gone. So she believed she might get off. I can't say that she betrayed any sense of uh, sorrow when Fred died. On the contrary, I think that she glowed with a certain relief. There was this kind of expectation that she wouldn't go to trial, that that would be the end of it. Without Fred West, the case against her was weakened, but an important witness had come forward who put Rose West firmly back in the frame. Although Rose West was to stand trial for all the Cromwell Street murders, there was no direct evidence to link her to the crimes. But an important witness had come forward. She had been attacked by the Wests in 1972, and unlike the others, had lived to tell her tale. Caroline Owens had been a kind of lodger slash babysitter nanny at Cromwell Street. She moves out, but the Wests want to get involved with her sexually which she's not interested in. Caroline died in 2016, but had previously spoken about her ordeal. She became the blueprint on which the Wests were to base their future murderous attacks. Trouble began when they gave her a lift one night. Fred turned around in his driver's seat and just kept punching me around the side of the head. At some point, I blanked out. Caroline was bound and gagged and taken back to Cromwell Street. I lay there and I, I'm blindfolded and gagged. I've got my hands tied by my back and I could feel them examining me down below. He must have took his belt off and he was beating me between the legs. I also felt the buckle a couple of times. Over the course of the night, she was sadistically assaulted and raped. When she screamed for help, Rose nearly killed her. Rose put a pillow over my head. At that point, I thought I might die. Next thing I see is Fred's face, really, really angry with me. And he said, we're gonna kill you and bury you in the paving stones cluster. Caroline managed to escape by promising to keep quiet, but then decided to go to the police. The Wests were arrested, but Caroline couldn't face giving evidence about the rape in open court. In 1973, the couple were convicted of indecent assault causing actual bodily harm and were fined 50 pounds each. I just, just made everything worse. It's almost like I oh, well, we got away with it. But only by the skin of our teeth. So next time they gotta die. Excuse me. Devastated by this realization, Caroline was determined to take the stand against Rose West in 1995. Tomorrow, a middle-aged woman will step into the dock and one of the most sensational trials of our time will begin. Hampshire police had mounted strict security along the route, 
closing roads as the convoy made its three-minute journey to Winchester city centre. Rosemary West was brought to trial at Winchester Crown Court in October 1995. 200 journalists and camera crews all hoping for at least a glimpse of the woman who faces 10 murder charges. Nine of those murders were from 25 Cromwell Street, including that of her 16-year-old daughter, and the 10th, the murder of eight-year-old Charmaine West, her stepdaughter. Sasha Wass, now a QC, was Rose West's junior defense barrister. Circumstantial evidence is rather like a jigsaw. Each piece can be quite meaningless on its own, but the prosecution say that if you put all of the pieces together, it presents a clear picture of the defendant's guilt. Forensic dentist Professor David Whitaker gave damning evidence about the timing of the death of eight-year-old Charmaine. He was able to identify when she died by the size of her emerging teeth. On my screen, Rosemary was watching a superb facial image of Charmaine coming out of the skull of the same child. The fact that I could time the death of Charmaine to within a month or two was absolutely crucial for the prosecution side on pinning it on Rosemary West. Records showed that Fred West had, as police suspected, been in prison at the time Charmaine was killed. I looked up, not purposely, and saw her watching, and she did not look comfortable. Juanita Mott's sisters were in court to see justice done on her behalf. You both attended the trial. Well, every day. We heard everything that went on, and I think it's just sickening to hear her try and justify things and wriggle her way out of it. How so? What, what, what do you mean? Well, passing the blame, Yeah, really. she was passing the blame a lot, denying that she'd been involved in it not giving us the truth that we needed as a family. We needed her to admit what she'd done, but she denied it. Arguably, the most compelling evidence came from Caroline Owens. One of the most important features of Caroline Owens as a witness is that uh, both Mr and Mrs West were arrested in relation to the assault upon her. The prosecution said that what had happened was similar, strikingly similar, what must have happened to the dead girls. The trial lasted six weeks. The jury took less than 24 hours to reach their verdict. She really believed she would get off, I think. And so when the jury came back with 10 unanimous guilty verdicts, you know, she was shocked. Rosemary West was sentenced to a whole life tariff, meaning that she will never be released from prison. In terms of what was found in the graves of these young women, there was no doubt that they met the most horrendous death. And I don't think there was anybody in that trial who was not affected by that. This afternoon, Rosemary West made the short journey to Winchester Jail. To this day, Rosemary West has never admitted her guilt. The police believe there may be other victims of the Wests. 15-year-old Mary Bastholm vanished from a bus stop in 1968, and an investigation into Gloucestershire's residential care homes revealed that several young women had simply disappeared. Got it down to three, but those three, we had no understanding at all of whether they knew the Wests, whether they were alive, where they lived, if they were alive, whether they were safe. It's unlikely that the Wests could get away with their crimes today. Legislation is in place to monitor sex offenders. Authorities share information about possible child abuse, and there have been changes in the way missing persons are recorded. The police are much more alert and aware that the sorts of crimes that occur within the family can spread to strangers, and therefore they need to be taken even more seriously. And the whole issue of serial killing, the, the great psychological debate around that is now part and parcel of police training. The West's crimes continue to leave deep scars. 
Marianne Partington has only been able to find peace by trying to forgive. I think this business of forgiveness is very much about um, finding a way of living in which you're in which you aren't corrupted by what's happened. But for the sisters of Juanita Mott, there is only one response. They're evil. They're just evil. There's no other words for them. To call them mentally ill is an insult to the mentally ill people. They're evil, and I'll underline that. No other word. Twenty-five years on, the story of Fred and Rosemary West remains as shocking as ever. But the passage of time and new details about what they did make it no easier to comprehend why they committed such horrible crimes. And unless Rose West speaks out, it's unlikely that we will ever know all the secrets of 25 Cromwell Street. Well, our crime and punishment season continues with another brand new documentary going behind the scenes of the UK's tactical firearms units. Line of Fire with Ross Kemp is next Thursday at 9.